The scenery here is monotonous. You can travel the 700 miles to the South Pole and it looks the same. But this location is the right combination of clean and deep ice, simple ice flow, and a high annual snowfall rate that makes it the best place on the planet to study the details of how past changes in greenhouse gases influence climate. There are other ice cores that have climate records that extend further back in time than we'll be able to collect from here. Those are great records, but what makes this place special is that we'll be able to recover a more detailed record. By comparing the timing of past changes in greenhouse gases and changes in temperature, we can improve our understanding of how human activity is changing climate now and how it will continue to change climate in the future. We spent three field seasons searching for this site. Now it'll take about five field seasons to collect all our samples. On a rare, nice summer day like this, it's great to be out here. Big sky, nice ice, and it's an easy commute to work. We built this building two years ago. You can see how much it snows and drifts around here. It's already pretty much buried. Come on inside. This is our drilling shelter. It's a steel arch building. And inside of it, of course, we have the drill. The drill is laid out horizontally right now. It's actually a one of a kind drilling tool. It's unlike any kind of water well or oil well drill. It's actually much more of a scientific instrument than a piece of drilling machinery. The business end of it is right down here. It has four razor sharp cutters. The drill is moved up into a vertical position and then lowered down into the ice sheet. This drilling head then rotates around and these cutters shave off a ring of ice. The drill slips down into that ring of ice and the core slides up into the core barrel. We then pull up on the core barrel and there are little latches in here that catch the core and we bring the core up to the surface. The drill work area is just a little bit below freezing, but to keep the gas samples trapped in the ice, we have to keep the temperature of the ice core below minus 20 Celsius. So on the other side of the window, where the core is pushed out of the drill, it's always cold. We even have a large refrigeration system to make sure it stays cold. Here comes the core. We collect about 2.5 meters of core each time the drill goes down the hole. The core is pushed into a green plastic net, which protects the core from damage. We don't make many measurements in the field. It's just too difficult to get the people and equipment out here. One measurement we make back home is to determine the isotopic ratio of the oxygen 18 and oxygen 16 in the water that makes up the ice. This ratio changes depending on what the air temperature was when the snow fell. We use this isotopic ratio to determine what the air temperature was in the past. Back home, we also measure the gases trapped in the air bubbles in the ice. We take an ice sample, put it into a vacuum chamber, and crush it. That releases the trapped gases and we measure what the concentration of greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, was in the past. This is a thin slice of an ice core. If you look at it under a special light fixture, the ice shows up as black and the bubbles are white. The pen is pointing to the bubbles. The gas in these bubbles is a sample of the atmosphere from when the snow was compressed into ice. We didn't come here to study Antarctica. We came here because this is where you have to come to determine what the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide was in the past. One of the few measurements we do make in the field is used to identify the annual layers in the ice. Snow that falls in the summer has a different chemical composition than snow that falls in the winter. That makes the electrical conductivity of the ice different in different seasons. So by measuring the electrical conductivity of the ice, we can identify the annual layers in the ice and count them to determine how old the ice is. It's sort of like counting tree rings. Each peak on this graph is one year. The ice is packed into tubes and boxes and moved back to the United States using a combination of ski-equipped cargo planes, ice-strengthened ships, and trucks. There are 30 scientists like myself who will make measurements on this ice. If you think it looks cold in here, well it is. Let's go outside, to the middle of Antarctica, where it's warm. We'll take a walk through camp to the dining hall and then look at some data. We're in the suburbs now. There's about 50 people here at camp. 
Everybody gets their own tent to sleep in, gives us a little bit of private space. Of course, we've got a lot of room to spread out between tents. Makes it kind of fun. We take all of our waste off of the site here. We leave nothing behind. About 85% of what we have, we can recycle. We have wood, aluminum, cardboard, food scraps. We don't recycle that. Light metal, office paper, and we have some burnable materials. Everything goes out with us. We use these yellow buildings as temporary structure in the summer. We take them down every winter so they don't get drifted in. This one's the dining hall. Let's get something warm to drink. Wow, it's, uh, it's awfully busy in here, I think. I think we might have to have this conversation elsewhere. Let's go outside. Let's take a look at some data. The data sets I'm going to show you today do not come from the ice current project that we just walked through. It's going to take us several years to make the measurements on that ice and interpret the results. So I'm going to show you data from another ice current project. This graph shows the relationship between greenhouse gases and temperature. The time span runs from 650,000 years in the past to current time. The bottom graph shows the concentration of atmospheric CO2 during that time, and the upper graph shows how temperatures change during that time. The CO2 information comes from air bubbles and ice cores. The temperature information comes from the isotopes stored in ice cores. What this graph shows is the remarkable relationship between high levels of CO2 in the atmosphere and warm conditions, and likewise, the relationship between low levels of CO2 and colder conditions. This relationship, a very tight linking between CO2 and climate, has existed for at least the last 650,000 years. The other thing that this graph shows is that the current levels of atmospheric CO2 are very anomalous. They're much higher than they've been at any time since at least the last 650,000 years. The data show that there's a strong correlation between high levels of CO2 in the atmosphere and warming, that the climate is warming today, and that humans are responsible for that warming. Now, I'm not going to tell you what to do in the future about how, what sort of decisions you should make. You have to make those decisions for yourself. But my hope is that you will use the best available science to make those decisions. So thank you for your interest in our science. And I've got to get back to my ice coring project. And I think the weather's going to be changing here soon, too.